most people's favorite way to work Fair Isle is in the round, which means you're going to get a jog. Now, when you work stripes, there's lots of fun ways to create a jogless join, but Fair Isle is a little more complicated. So first of all, let's look at what that jog is. Here we see a little bitty swatch, and this is a uh, part of my pattern from the Rhinebeck Cowl. Now there's my end of round marker, and you can see a couple of things. Right here, you can clearly see that little triangular motif. Ah, has that jog. Instead of two stitches, visually it looks like three, because we know the end of round is higher than the beginning of round. So right there, those two stitches are higher and they look visually like they connect to the third stitch. Here you see this line going right in the middle of these three stitches, but at the join, you can see it looks like it's at the bottom. Here you have this little triangle, and again, you have that little jog right there. So it's not terrible. If you're doing a cowl, you could wear that in the back, but a hat or a sweater might make you crazy. This is what it looks like. You can see that what we have, if I've, um, I'm using the second repeat here to show how it ends up one row higher. So does that look familiar? There's those three stitches in a row. There's that line coming to the bottom of these three stitches. Here's that little jog. So that's exactly what my knitting is doing. So what about working into the row below? That fabulous little trick that Meg Swanson developed years ago for stripes. Why doesn't it work for Fair Isle? Well, first, let's take a look at what it does for stripes and why we have to move the end of round marker. So here I've worked one round, right? There's one round in my white, and I've removed the end of round marker. Why? As you can see, I have one round of the white showing. And the trick for the jogless join is to insert my needle back to front, into the row below, lift it up onto my needle, and then I knit that stitch. What I'm doing is I'm making the first stitch of the second round become the last stitch of the first round. So you can see why I now replace my marker. I still visually have only one white stitch. So when I work a second round, it tricks this. It has brought the beginning of the round up to match the end of the round. But of course I have to move the marker because I want to visually have the same number of white stitches all the way across. So this stitch gets worked twice. Why doesn't that work for Fair Isle? I had a knitter swear that what they did is work into the row below every row without moving the marker because she mentioned what happens is by lifting up the row below in Fair Isle each time, you do get to see that color change. And that's true, but let's take a look at what happens. First, I'll look at it right on the little swatch we were just doing. So, here I've put that marker back and I have worked into the row below, but I haven't removed the marker. Now let's just pretend I'm working a whole other round. I'm just gonna do this um, without actually working another round. And of course the row below this time is that white stitch. And I lift that up on my needle and I knit it with whatever color. I'm gonna knit it with a separate color right now. And what it does is it kind of brings up that color and they're nesting together. However, what you get is basically brioche. So let's take a look at a swatch where I've worked into the row below every round. So here's that original swatch where I did nothing, right? It's flat, it's smooth, but it does have a jog. Here, 
is where I worked into the row below every single round without moving the marker. Now, if you kind of squint at it, let's just compare. If I kind of squint at this, um, it's a little more jogless because, you know, there I do have the three, uh, three white stitches in a row. Um, it's, it's a little better, but you can also see that what I have, and there I'll show it to you in profile, is this elongated braid that to me is, um, not that much less offensive than doing nothing and getting a jog. So let's take a look at a better way. So what's actually happening when we work into the row below and why is it basically brioche? Well, let's take a look at a little arts and crafts first. So say this green line is my end of round marker and I've worked my first round of brioche and now I am up to that end of round marker. And what I do is I take the row below and I lift it up onto my needle. This is the same effect of fisherman's rib or brioche when you do that yarn over, FYI. Now I work into that stitch. So if I never move the marker and each time I'm working into the row below, being very careful to pick up the right color, I get both colors existing at the same time because unlike the stripe where we only brought it up once, we're bringing it up every round, but you can see that effect of brioche. So you've got that one thick elongated line. So if I do it every single time, every single time I lift up the row below, I get that not very attractive line. So let's look at a better way. Although you might have a fair isle pattern that is made up of triangles, where you can move the marker. If I don't want to move the marker and I don't want to alter the chart, I wanted to come up with a play on that original jogless join, where remember we were working into the row below on the second round and then moving the marker, which meant the first stitch of the second round became the last stitch and that stitch was worked twice. So instead, what we're gonna do is work the last stitch of the round twice and we won't have to move the marker. Take a peek at the finished product and then we'll look at how it works. So here you can see, I've got a little swatch in progress. This is my end of round marker right there. I just moved them onto the needle so it would lie flat. And you can see no elongated bump, and this really is genuinely jogless. I have the little triangle here, a little triangle there. That line is going in the middle. That line is going in the middle. Here's my triangle. Here's my triangle. Genuinely jogless. Let's take a look at how we do it. Here are your steps. The first thing you're going to do is work one full round of your fair isle. When you get to the last stitch, transfer it from the right needle back to the left needle and you're going to work that stitch again using the color of the first stitch of round two. Now work round two and when you get to the last stitch work into the row below. So here I have a piece in progress and I have finished round 11. So um, because I've finished round 11, I need to move the last stitch I've worked back and I need to work that last stitch again with the first color of round 12. Now you're going to notice they're the same color. So here I have finished round 11 
And the first thing I'm going to do is transfer that stitch from the right needle to the left needle. Now I need to work it again, but since I'm working it again with the same color, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cross that ball of yarn under my other color. So I am going to pick up the blue again and work that stitch a second time. Now some of this needs a little fussing with tension, but it's okay. You're going to see it blocks out beautifully. So there I've moved that stitch and I'm going to knit it a second time. So remember when we finish this round, we are going to work into the row below. Now I will work all around 12. So my first three stitches are the blue, then I'm going to work all the way around and I'll meet you at the end of the round and we'll look at working in to the row below. So I'm almost at the end of the round here and we end with two whites. So there's one, but now is when I need to work into the row below. So remember this was the stitch that I've worked twice. So now I'm going to lift up the row below and I'm going to knit my final stitch of round 12. But now I have to transfer it back from the right hand needle to the left hand needle and knit it again with the first stitch of round 13. And again, you can see the first stitch of round 13 is the same color. So what I'm going to do is just slide that white color under the blue. And by the way, you can, you can always, you can cross the, the first stitch color under every time, even if it's a different color, but you have to do it if it's the same color, otherwise it really won't work. So I'm going to knit that stitch a second time. And now I would begin round 13. I got to make sure that I'm, I'm, I was throwing with the white. So I really want to keep consistent there. So I am going to start my round 13 and let's get all the way to the end. And we'll take a look at working into the row below uh, one more time. And the end of round 13, we have a blue, blue, and we have a white where we will once again work into the row below, lifting up that row below onto the needle, working the color that is the last color of the round, but then putting it back on the needle and working the first color of the next round. And here's our first example of the first color of the next round being a different color. So you can see um, I could just pick up that blue because it's already crossed under the white. Oops, I split that yarn a little bit. There we go. Work that a second time and then continue the round. So I'm going to finish this whole swatch, block it, and then we'll take a look. There we have our trio of swatches doing nothing, working into the row below every row, and my trick, which is working one full round, transferring the last stitch worked back from the right hand needle to the left hand needle, knitting it again with the first color of the next round, then working to that last stitch and working into the row below. Let's take a quick look at each one. Option number one, doing nothing. And by the way, I also did nothing to make the cast on or bind off jogless. And you can see how even with using the tail to connect the braid, uh, you have that little visible jog where it's higher. So you can see the patterning doesn't match up. Version number two, working into the row below. You have this elongated braid. The color kind of lines up better. 
but not perfectly. And also it actually dips in a bit because it's really pulling this section in. And finally, da 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 da, really, truly, genuinely jogless. There's my end of round marker. I did my trick for my uh, jogless cast on. Um, I did my trick for the jogless bind off. They're both in my book, Patty's Knitting Bag of Tricks. You can see the level is exactly the same. And you can also see no bulk, no elongated stitch, but really genuinely jogless. So whether or not it's worth it to you to do that extra step depends on whether it's a cowl and you can hide the jog in the back of your neck, or it's a hat or a sweater, or if you just think it's cool. Enjoy.